This is chapter nine, um, peri-implant health and diseases. So we're gonna talk a little bit first about dental implants. Um, a dental implant is a non-biologic device surgically inserted into the jawbone to replace a missing tooth or to provide support for a prosthetic denture. When you replace um, teeth with, den with um, dental implants, it's not always a one-on-one -on -one replacement. In other words, if you lose three teeth, we don't always have to place three teeth um, in order to get full function. Oftentimes we can do implant supported bridges or implant supported removable prosthetics. Um, sometimes um, as far as function, we don't need to replace a tooth we, or two teeth, we only need to replace one. So there's variations in how dental implants are evaluated for placement. Um, dental hygienists play an important role in patient education and professional maintenance. So um, once the implant is placed and has been restored, it's up to the dental hygienist to work with the patient on making sure they can take care of the implant. Um, dental hygienists must be able to distinguish peri-implant health from peri-implant disease. So um, we do treat dental implants. Um, we are usually on the front line as far as recognizing disease on dental implants versus health. Um, so it's important that we are able to distinguish the difference between health and disease and what we can do to um, turn around disease. So let's start with what the implant is all about. Um, the implant is called an implant system because there's several parts that go to a dental implant. You've got the implant body, which is what we consider to be like the root of a tooth. It's the part that looks um, like a screw. It looks like a single um, post is what we kind of call it a lot of times or an, um, an implant post um, in root. The post is, um, the implant root is made out of titanium. The post is the abutment part. So when we um, talk about the implant after it's been completely restored, um, it will contain all of the different parts. So um, the abutment can pr protrude partially or fully through the gingival tissue, um, and it supports the crown or denture, and it's biocompatible or not rejected with the body. So the implant body is the part that's placed, um, that's kind of screwed into the bone, and then the abutment part is placed on top of it. And there's two different ways that implants can be placed. They can be under the tissue or they can stick out of the tissue. And I'll show you more of that in just a few minutes. Let's finish talking about the parts. So the implant body um, is usually made out of titanium. Um, the advantages to titanium is it's very well accepted by the body. And it's also a poor conductor of heat and electricity. So in other words, it doesn't get hot or heat up very easily when you eat and drink hot foods and, and just the temperature of the body and stuff. The di de disadvantages is that it's softer than other dental materials. So in other words, you can scratch them. And there could possibly be an immunologic reaction. Um, about the abutment, the, I, the abutment is considered the titanium post. It attaches to the implant body. It protrudes partially through the gingival tissues and supports the restoration. And this is what an implant system looks like. So you'll see that um, for orientation, the two pink and the alveolar bone would be um, the part of your um, alveolar. And then you've got your implant body, which is the screw part. And then you've got the abutment, which attaches to the screw and sticks up. And that's the part that the crown or restoration is going to sit on. An implant restoration looks different than um, a regular crown would on a tooth because it has to have something to attach to. They used to cement implant restorations in place, just like a crown. And over the years, they've gotten a little away from that and have gotten more into the screw retained implants because when they cemented a crown onto the abutment, two things. One, it would be hard to get it off if there's a problem with the implant. And two, there would be some overspill of the cement that's used to place the crown onto the abutment that didn't get cleaned off and it would cause the implant to fail. 
Oh, this image is a screw retained crown. So you can see how the crown has a whole different little um, inside process that's going to help um, keep it attached to the abutment and the abutment into the implant body. So the abutment actually screws, as you can see, into the implant body right here. And then this screw right here is going to come all the way through and it's going to screw this into here. Um, the bottom of the implant has an opening or a channel in it and it will fill in with bone to help give it some um, more solid uh, healing to it and it's threaded like a screw so that the bone can grow into these different threads and that's what gives it a little bit more support. This is a picture of the first one is a radiographic image of an implant and you can see the implant body and you can see the abutment. This is what it would look like after it was placed but before it was restored. This is the abutment right here. This is a more like a ceramic abutment and then the crown is placed. These are some um, implants and components. There are lots of what we call implant systems out there and they're usually based off of the company's name. So like in this particular picture, it says courtesy of Zimmer. This is a Zimmer implant. Um, there's Strawman, um, there, there's a bunch of um, Noble BioCare. So there's a bunch of different companies. So we refer to the implant system based on the company that makes them. So we would say like it's a Strawman implant. And so um, this particular one is Zimmer. This is what their implants look like. And you can see there's a variation in how wide apart the threads are. And there's a variation in how long and how wide the implants are. The length and the width of the implant is determined by how much bone is available. You want to use the largest implant body you can use without disrupting the cortical bone. Um, this is where your cortical and cancellous bone and stuff come into play. You want to keep your cortical plates or your cortical bone intact and the implant's going to fit down the center. If you go too big and you disrupt that cortical bone, you can have problems with the implant not being stable. The length of the implant depends on several things. Um, for example, on the maxillary arch, the length of the implant depends on how low the floor of the sinus comes down. In other words, how much bone do you have available to place the implant? And then, um, and then on the um, width of the implant, it depends on how wide the alveolar ridge is. So um, we've got here the implants. We've got something called healing caps and cover screws. So depending on the type of implant, as you can see, when you look at these implants, the top of the cylinder is open. You can kind of see it down here. If we placed that, tissue would grow inside of it. And so we don't want that to happen. We want it, we want it to stay um, open so that we can put the abutment, place the abutment. So they put on something called a healing cover or a healing cap, and that keeps the tissue from growing inside of it. Um, Here's some other pictures of what implants look like. There's the dental implant and there's the abutment. So you can see the implant was placed underneath the tissue and the abutment is attached or screwed in, into the top of the implant. Um, this is a picture of dental implants supporting a removable partial. So they've placed these implants into the jaw and then this partial has little clips on it that will fit around the abutment and snap into place. It's an alternative to a removable partial like you see over here in picture A. This would not, um, this would be removable, still be removable, but it's gonna have a nice tight fit as compared to this because these implants are anchored in the bone just like regular teeth would be. So there's no movement, there's no squishiness. Um, a lot of patients when they wear like a removable parcel or a, a denture, um, one of the things that happens is your saliva gets up over the alveolar ridge between the denture and the alveolar ridge. And patients describe it as like if you were uh, biting down on a sponge, it's got a little bit of a squishy give to it. 
which is makes um, eating a lot of hard foods like chewing steak and stuff really uncomfortable. Where something like this, these are anchored in the bone. There's no squishy feeling. It's solid, and so it's a much nicer alternative. This is what the surgical placement of the implant looks like. So here's your alveolar bone without a tooth or edentulous. And then here's the placement, the starting of the placement. They, um, there's a drill that's used, a surgical drill. It sounds like a regular drill and they will actually go in and just drill a hole into the bone. Now there's a lot of precision that goes along with implant placement, okay? It's absolutely necessary that the implant is placed in the exact right position. And the position is based on occlusion usually. So we want to position the implant in the same position that the natural tooth was placed so that when you have occlusion, the occlusion stays the same. If the implant's not placed exactly in the right spot and your occlusion is hitting it like off to one side, you're going to damage the bone on that one side. So it's imperative that the, the occlusion be perfect on an implant so that the um, occlusal force is distributed evenly on the implant. Patients who grind or clench their teeth um, oftentimes will, or not oftentimes, usually will have to wear an, an occlusal guard so that they don't clench or grind their teeth on the implant. This is um, the drill making the hole. And what they do is they start out with a smaller drill and they get the implant the length that they want. So they'll drill a hole and then they take this little like guide and they'll take an x-ray, it's a metal, like a little piece of metal and they put it in there and they'll measure and they'll see where they are via a, a radiograph. So during the procedure, you'll stop and you'll take an x-ray and you'll look at the x-ray and see if you need to go deeper or how deep you are. Um, on the mandibular, you have to be careful that you don't hit any of the nerves that run the inferior alveolar nerve or anything that runs along the bottom. So you wanna place the implant above the nerve. Then after you've got it the right depth, you can go ahead and keep making, using larger drill bits to create larger openings. And then the implant is placed in its spot and there it is. The tissue still flapped at that point. And at this point, they've closed the tissue around it for healing. Um, you could do submerged or unsubmerged. So a submerged implant is where the implant screw is placed below the level of the bone and is covered by tissue for healing. It's um, so when the patient leaves, they don't see anything. They'll have a few sutures across the top, but that's all they have. The sutures will come out in a couple of weeks and they just wait the time, the rest of the healing time, which is usually about three months for it to heal. And so then um, there's something called an unsubmerged implant. An unsubmerged implant is where the implant screw is placed at the level of the bone and then the heat, the abutment is placed right away so that the tissue and the tissues re um, sutured around it, but the abutment sticks out. The problem with the submerged one is that you have to then come in after it's healed and they have to open the tissue and place the abutment. So it requires a second minor surgical procedure where when the abutment's placed right away, um, it doesn't require a second procedure. The, the type of implant, whether they go submerged or unsubmerged, really just kind of depends on where, um, where in the mouth it's being, re being placed, um, the patient's care. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into consideration. It's, there's not like a chart or anything where you could say, okay, this is, this is what we're going to do for this case and this is how we're going to do this one. And it's going to vary from surgeon to surgeon as well. Peri-implant tissues, this is the part we really care about. The peri-implant tissues are the soft tissue surrounding the dental implant. Similar to, in many ways to the periodontium of a natural tooth, but there are important differences. So the implant to epithelial 
tissue interface. So how does the epithelium and the implant relate to each other? The epithelium adapts to the titanium abutment post, creating what they call a biologic seal. So the biologic seal functions as a barrier between the implant and the oral cavity. So in other words, it, it seals around the implant so bacteria from the oral cavity can't work their way around down into the deeper tissues, just like the sulfular epithelium surrounds the implant. 